something to be celebrated. When you go to have something to celebrate. And we have something. God has done so many things, but He wants to do so many things. He's a continual present God of the now. And so we want to celebrate the past, but what He wants to do is do something now that we can celebrate and rejoice in again. And so as I read that in verse, will you not remind us again? I, my prayer is do it again, Lord. Do it again. Not like you did before, but do it again in a new and fresh way. Do it again. Revive us and cause us to rejoice in you. That has to be the cry of our heart. Until we desperately follow him, we will know what it means to encounter him in a new and fresh way. There has to be that desperation. And we read it in the Psalms. We read it through great people of God. Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water, longingly for the water, my soul pants longingly for you, O God. Psalm 27, one thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. What for? So that I can receive tithes and offering, receive ministry and the platform and the title? No, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Gaze on your beauty, the beauty of the Lord, and to seek him. He wasn't interested in the mechanics and the programs and what was going on. He was captivated by God. My soul longs for you. My, I seek you above all else. To gaze on your beauty. These are the cries of people who wanted God more than anything else and above all else. They were desperate for Him. That's the language that comes out of a person who is seeking God. And so I'm praying this morning that God would stir this up within us. And He would unsettle us and He would shake things up. He would shake things up. Have you noticed sometimes when you go to use salt and nothing comes out and you think it's empty, it's not actually empty? What's happened is it's gone all dry and stuck to the side. And so you've got to bag it and shake it up a little bit. And I think the church is like that. We're not empty, but sometimes we've gone a little bit dry and stuck to our traditions and programs and the way of doing things. And God comes along and shakes the salt shaker. He shakes it up a little bit so that it can be used for his glory and his purpose. This world, our community, our families, our friends, will not be reached by just a program or a course or a clever idea or a strategy. We know that our friends, our families, the people out there need to be reached, but they'll only do it through the power of God. And God comes and manifests in himself. I thank God for the program and for the ministries and the different courses that are out there that are helping to do that. But at the end of the day, it's going to have to take more than that. The problems of the day are going to take the power of God, the presence of God, they're going to take a dynamic that is greater than what we can think or create or produce. It's going to take a God who is awesome, manifesting himself amongst these people, so that even those who doubt, even those who criticize, even those who scoff, will say, God is amongst them. God is amongst them, not because Alpha told me, but because the Alpha and Omega is amongst them. That's what it's going to take to reach them and see a difference and an impact in our community. But where does all this start? How do we do this? Lord, revive us again that we rejoice in you. We want you to make us alive again and quicken us. We want to be sensitive to your spirit. We don't want to forget about the third member of the Trinity, but we want to walk with it step by step. And Paul says, keep in step with the spirit so that he's leading you and guiding you. When you read the book of Acts, you know, there were places that God said, I want you to go and preach in this city. And then there were other places that Paul said, the Holy Spirit restrained me not to go. Isn't that incredible? You think, well, you should go everywhere. But he said, no, I don't want you to go to this city. I want you to go there. I want you to do this. He was led by the Spirit of God. He was prompted by the Spirit of God. He had visions. Peter had visions. And he saw what God was doing. And he saw people of Macedonia saying, come to us. That's the God that we serve. And that's what we need in this church today. Where God just comes. And we are sensitive. And we are open. And we just love God so much and we're allowing his Holy Spirit to truly move amongst us and have his way. And I believe it starts with a holy discontent. An unholy discontent is where you have enough, but our selfish and greed, selfishness and greed wants more. You know? But I have enough food, but I want something else. I know it's having to be a nice and hungry. Ken told me that one. Nice and hungry. We want more. You've got plenty of food in the cupboard, but you open the cupboard and say, oh, there's plenty of food. But it's just not what you fancy. You've got a nice house, but you want a better house. 
You've got a nice car, but you want to wreck the car. You know, and you're always striving for more and keeping up with everybody else. That's unholy discontent, where we are willing to be thankful for what we have and be content with what we have. But holy discontent is where God troubles us and agitates us and moves us because we're not content with what we are. We're thankful and grateful, but there's a desire and a sense within us that God is saying there's more. I'm sustaining you, but as Chris says, I'm not satisfying you because there's so much more. I ate yesterday, guess what? I'm gonna eat again today. Because yesterday's food doesn't sustain me for today. I drank yesterday, but today I'm gonna drink again because I'm thirsty again. And that desire leads me to my tap and to get a glass and fill up again. I don't just say to myself, Yeah, hey, you drank yesterday, that's enough. That'll sustain you, keep going. No, I go and once again sustain myself and supply myself with what I need. And God says the same thing. Hey, I did that yesterday, I did that last year, I did that a hundred years ago, but I want to do it again in a perhaps a different, fresh way, but I want to sustain you again. So don't get content, don't get complacent, don't just think this is all there is. I'm just going to autopilot. I want to come again. And so God, I'm asking God this morning to do something that we might not want or like, but that is desperately needed. That he would cause us to be troubled and agitated so that we don't accept church as we know it, and we don't do church as we know it, but something fresh, God comes again and moves amongst us. I really believe that church should be exciting and scary. It shouldn't be so predictable. It shouldn't be so clinical or sterile. We don't need an omenometer when God is moving. We don't need that. We don't need to say, can someone say amen? When God is moving amongst us. So God can make us discontent. I had a great quote sent to me from Chris this week and I, I pinched it off him. Um, it's by Janet Cooper. Some of you know who Janet Cooper is. He's a pastor up in England. And, uh, if you go on YouTube, he, he doesn't seem to let the prophet speak. And he's got a very prophetical edge to him. But he says this, and, and it's just amazing. He says, this is my new era cry. Having done attraction of church for decades, I've finally done with attraction of church. Anyone else? Others may be called to build using this method, but for me, it doesn't go deep enough spiritually. It often starts as Christianity life and continues in the vein of all too often. It often lacks the prophetic, the power, the miraculous, the potency, and the role of the Gospels and the voidable offense that leads to surrender and repentance. It doesn't go deep enough relationally. Church must be more than sitting in tiny rows, singing trendy songs, nodding at the music corners, and critiquing the platform experience as if it were a therapeutic entertainment. We need a home, a family, a band of brothers, not an event, with an audience and our favorite celebrity preachers. None of us can thrive without deeply belonging to a small tribe of adventurers who are on a quest to know God deeply, surrender wholeheartedly to the point of personal pain, and who live to selflessly reach a world of purpose that is beyond themselves. Yes, I'm done with attraction of lights, camera, action, concert style church. It's time for a radical remedy to rise up. How about you? And that's the cry today. That's the cry. That beyond the superficial, there will be something of substance that is going to make a difference in this world. The superficiality isn't going to do it, but supernatural will. And that is why I pray. But we have to have a desire for that. There has to be a discontent in what we have so that they can produce within us a longing for something more. If you're content, you're not going to long for anything else. After I've eaten, I don't go back to the cabin looking for more food. Or sometimes I do, but. When you're full, you're usually full. But God says, no, no, I want to create a desire in you, an acute desire for something, something so much more than what we have. Radical hope, radical faith, radical love. God moving, an avalanche of God's favour, power, and glory moving in this place. God stirring our hearts. It says about Samson that he, when God blessed his parents and gave him a child, and said he started to grow. And Holy Spirit came upon him, and the very next words it says he started to stir him. And I think that's how we fall out. When God, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it stirs you. And that word means to agitate and trouble. Because God wants to pick a fight with the Philistines, so you sound this and do it. God wasn't happy with the way the Philistines were treating his people, and he needed someone to stand up and say, actually, I'm going to do something about this. So he raised up Samson, that judge, 
But for him to do something, he had to be troubled about it and agitated. And so the Holy Spirit stirred him. I'm praying, do it again, Lord, do it again. Stir us. So we're troubled about our society. We're troubled about the things that are going on. We're troubled about the fact that this is an outreach people group, that this, this community isn't coming to Christ, that this church isn't full, that our families aren't coming to know the Lord. May that trouble us and agitate us to the point that we have to just do something about it. That's what God wants. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And so this morning, you're not going to be surprised, and I want to take an example from David and Goliath. And I was praying for Chris to stop. I was going to stop. Scott, he's pinching all my server over here. And he didn't know that I was going to speak on this. He knew I was going to do a series on the right, but he didn't know where I was going from it or what I was going to do on it at all. So thank you for sharing that. And that encourages me and sets me up ready to go. So 1 Samuel 17, if you want to turn there, I'm just going to pull out a few because it's not going to read the whole story because it's so well known. Um, I'm, I'm going to take it an assumption that you know the majority. I'm going to sum it up in case you don't, but I'm going to make the assumption that you know the majority of the story of David and Goliath. We know that the armies had come to battle. The Philistines were on one side, the Israelites were on the other. There was a valley in between, and every day, the, the giant Goliath came up and taunted the people of God. And I think he says he came up, was it 40 days he did this far? He came up every day for 40 days and he taunted and defied the people of God. He said, where is your champion? Where is the man with courage and strength to fight me? We don't need to go to war in mass, uh, in, in a mass fight. Just send up one man to fight me. And if you win, we'll surrender. And if I win, you'll surrender. That's what they used to do in ancient times. This, Count the, uh, the body count and the blood loss, they would send out sometimes just one champion to fight each other and send it away. And Goliath was a giant, he was enormous, he was intimidating, he was frightening, and he was enjoying defying the people of God. And the people of God were trembling and fearful, and no one would step up, not even King Saul. Nobody. They were all dressed up, but they weren't going anywhere. They looked the part, but they weren't the part. They were standing there, dressed as soldiers but they lacked the spirit to fight. And then Jesse, the father of David, says to David, go and see your brothers, ask them what they are, and let me know, and while you go, take some supplies for them. And this is where we pick up the story in verse 20 of 1 Samuel 17. It says, early in the morning, David left the flock in the cave of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse, his father, had directed him. And he reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. That makes me laugh. They were shouting at war cry. <laughs> they weren't willing to fight, but they sounded good. I went to church to do that. Israel and the Philistines were growing up their lives facing each other. David left the same for the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle line, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped up from his line and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. That's very important. David heard it. Verse 26. David asked the men standing here, what will be done to the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? And then he says this, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This is a teenager, a young man, standing amongst mature men and mature soldiers who had fought in other wars and were battle scarred and battle ready weren't willing to fight. And this spocky little teenager comes along and says, who is this Philistine? Who does he think he is? He fired the armies of God. They had heard this day after day for 40 days. David comes along, he only heard it once, and he said, what? What? And nobody's doing anything? See, in this passage, we see holy discontent. He wasn't discontent because he just wanted to fight. He wasn't discontent because he was too young to sign up for the army or he wanted to be like his brother. He was discontent because this guy was defying God. He was saying, our God's greater than God. And what I've done to other nations, I will do to you. So don't think your God will save you. He won't. I'm going to crush you. I'm going to kill you. We are going to come and oppress you. And he kept doing it and doing it. No one would shut him up. No one would step up and say, wait a minute. You can't say that about our God. There is only one God, and he is going to prove himself. They needed an Elijah who stepped up, you know, and said on the on the bring your prophets and let's have a showdown and let's see who the real God is. That's what they needed, but nobody was doing it. And this teenager comes along and says, What's going on? 
Someone needs to do something. He's defying God. He's defying us. He's, put, he's brought a disgrace upon us. We should be ashamed of ourselves. Isn't anyone bothered? The trouble was, they probably were bothered, but their fear was greater than their discontent. The fear of the enemy was greater than their passion for God. And you will never do anything for God when your fear of the enemy is greater than your passion for God. You won't. Because he will intimidate you. He will defy you. He will challenge you. And unless God troubles us and stirs our heart and shows us his greatness and who he is, we will never stand up to him and say, actually, I don't believe that. We are going to step out. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you. You're not going to intimidate me anymore. Even if I've got to come trembling before you. Because courage is not the absence of fear. It's doing something even though you're afraid. But somebody has to step up. David was going to be the man. He was going to be that person that God was going to use to close the mouth of this giant and bring um, his glory back to Israel and declare who the true and living God was. He was going to use this unlikely person, this unlikely teenager, to come and do what no one else was willing to do. And I love it when God raises up people that are so unexpected. And he uses them to do things that we don't expect. Suddenly from nowhere someone comes. Evan Roberts was like that. Come from nowhere and suddenly led into a revival. Great people, John Wesley, George Whitfield, you can name them all. People who are very little known, Smith Wiggles, all the everyday people. Suddenly they're not getting the power of God. It's not about us, it's about him. David didn't clothe himself with God, God clothed himself with David. And he said, what should I to do? And he raises up people from nowhere in the least expected ways to do incredible things. But it starts with a holy discontent. Does it bother you that our, that our society is full of atheism? Does it bother us that our society mocks the name of God? Does it bother us that they're redefining marriage and gender and sex and they're telling our kids things that are going to ruin and destroy their lives? Does it bother us? It should, and until it does, nothing will be done. Does it bother us? So many things going on. Holy discontent, what does it look like? David had it, and he showed us a model of what happens when we have holy discontent. So I want to give you a few things for you to understand. Number one, holy discontent will cause unexpected criticism. I'm telling you that because I want you to know what you're getting into. So that if God troubles and agitates your heart, don't come back to me and say, well, I didn't expect that response. So I'm telling you beforehand, these are some of the things that happens. Because in verse 28, it says that Eliab, his oldest brother, when he heard uh, David speak to men, his anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? And then he says this to him. You don't expect this from your bigger brother. He's the one who looks after you. He's the one who takes care of you. The one you're looking up to. But he says this. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. In other words, he says, I know your wicked heart. For you've come down here to see the battle. And David turns and says, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? And he says, he turned from him towards another and said the same thing. And these people answered him in the first what he's doing. Why is his brother so angry with him? Why was his anger aroused when he was asking people what's going on, what's happening, and what will the king do for this person? And I've often wondered in life why sometimes we get pushback where you don't expect it, where you people respond in a way you think, why? Why? And I think sometimes the reason is, is because someone is willing to do what they weren't willing to do. Maybe someone is willing to step up and do something and they become who they think they are. Come on, that's what we do, don't we? Who do they think they are to say that? Who do they think they are to do that? Who do they think they are? I know it happened when I became a pastor in this church. I know there were people who said, who does he think he is? To take over from him. But it doesn't matter who I think I am, it just matters who he thinks I am. And it doesn't matter who Ken calls, it matters who he calls. And we're obedient to that. I have nothing in myself, but I'm everything in Christ. And I know there were people who struggled with that. 
There were people who said to me, you know, I, I don't really know what to call you now. I feel uncomfortable calling you pastor. I said, why did I do? That's what people call me all my life. But they struggled with that. And sometimes you have that kind of response of people find it very difficult. I didn't expect a boy from the to come to this church and then suddenly pass to me. I was unlikely, covered in tattoos, full of acne. I was unlikely. But God uses unlikely people. He used the donkey once, he can use the donkey again and he can win the day. You know, that's my, that's my criteria, that's my credentials for pastoring and leading and preaching. God can use a donkey. But his brother got angry and upset with him about this. And David said, well, is there not a cause? Isn't there a reason to be upset and angry and for someone to do something about it? And sometimes when we get discontent with things, people will misinterpret that. And misunderstand they think, why do you want to change things? Leave things alone. Why do you always want to do something else and do something more? Why are you always challenging us? What's the matter? And they misinterpret that as just change for the sake of change, because we're bored or because we want to do something new or we're caught up with the latest fad. But sometimes it's God stirring our hearts and stirring within us a longing and a desire to do something that we're not happy to hear what's going on in the world and do nothing about it. We're not happy with seeing our friends and families going to a crisis eternity. We're not happy with the lack of prayer in church, with the lack of presence of God, with the lack of supernatural and miracles where we lay hands on people and nothing happens. Sometimes we're just not happy and we can say, God, there is so much more. The church doesn't look like the book of Acts, and it should. You're still a miracle working God. We're not seeing miracles. Why not? And instead of thinking, oh, well, God knows. We get on our knees and say, God, this isn't good enough. We want more. And people who won't like that because it makes them uncomfortable. It makes them unsettled. But some people are, are happy with that. And so he agitates us and stirs us. And so be ready for the criticism. Be ready for the pushback. Be ready for people to misinterpret your motives. Because he said to David, you guys know your heart. No, you don't. He says it's wicked. It's full of pride. It is not. Because in chapter 16 it says God chose David because of his heart. And when you step into Acts 13 in the New Testament, the, the testimony was God chose David because he was a man after God's own heart. Is God insolent? Is God proud? No. David was following God. He did all that he would call him to do. He was faithful. It says he fulfilled the plans of God and then he died in his own generation. Eliab did not know his heart. What he was doing was projecting his weaknesses, his fear, his um, lack and inability to do something upon David. I know your heart, I know why you do this. No, you do not. You don't know my heart, you don't know my motives, you don't know my reasons and my intentions. God knows. And that's the thing we have to cling to when we move, when we're seeking God, when we step out, when we're uncertain things and shaking things up. There will be pushback, there will be criticism, and we say, you know what, God knows my heart. He knows why I'm doing this. He knows why. And that gives us courage, that gives us strength. I like the fact that it says David turned away and carried on talking. And sometimes all we can do is turn away from the criticism and say, I'm not going to listen to it. It isn't true, it isn't right, and it isn't from God, so I'm not going to listen to it. I'm going to turn away because I know God has called me. I know the discontent is from Him. May God help us to overcome that criticism. Craig Warren said, Don't let pride go to your heart and don't let criticism go to your head. And that's true. We have to come to that place of maturity where we keep on going and fix our eyes on Him. Secondly, when we are wholly discontent and we're asking God to revive us and move amongst us, it challenges unwritten rules. Verse 38 says, Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, but he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, but I have not tested them. So David put them off. It is crazy to go to war and it is crazy to fight with people when you haven't put your armor on. That's not what you did. Every soldier knows that you have to get kitted up. You have to, when he says, you put the gear on. Some people have the gear and no idea, they say to me. I was like, how oh, I started, you used to start running, I'd have all the gear, I had no idea. And these guys have all the gear, they looked the part, but they weren't the part. Because it takes more than a sword and a shield and some armor to make you a soldier. 
You can put an helmet on my head and a gun in my arm. That doesn't mean I'm going to go and fight, or I'll have the courage to fight. It takes more than that. It's mentally, it's emotionally, it's spiritually. It has to have that attitude and, and that fighting spirit within us. And so to go to war without these things was suicide. And so David, when he chose to take these things off, I can imagine the people seeing him going out to meet the life and they thought, he's mad and he's dead. Let's start digging the grave ready. Because number one, he's only a teenager, and this is a grown man. He is inexperienced, this man has killed many. He's got his weapons and his armor, and this guy is going out with just a sling and some stones. <laughs> this is suicide. This is suicide. Archaeologists stand up a skeleton in this very place many years ago. And when they dug up the skeleton in this place where this battle, uh, where this battle took place, um, they, f they found that the man, that the, the person they dug up was a male, and he had died of heart failure. That's incredible. And I thought, how do they know that? How do they dig up bones and see that he died of heart failure? But they said, the reason we know that he died of heart failure because he had a little note in his hand, and when we opened it, it said 10 shekels on the layer. It's a joke. I lay you catch up, I lay you catch up. He died of heart failure. Because nobody expected him to win. But you've got to understand that David didn't go out ill-equipped or unprepared. He took off what didn't fit him. He took off what wasn't going to work for him. He took off what that which wasn't made for him. It says Saul put his armor on him. And Saul's armor was not going to fit David. It was not going to help him. And so he had the courage to say to the king, and if he was the king, this wasn't just his brother or a friend or someone else, this was the king. And it was probably a great privilege to be um, clothed by the king and given his armor. But he went against tradition, he went against the unwritten rules, he went against the custom and the norms and said, I can't fight in this. I can't fight in this. And so he took it off. And we have to have the courage to do that and say, this doesn't fit me, this doesn't work for me, it wasn't made for me. It's not made for who I am, so I'm going to take it off. I'm not going to let other people put on me what doesn't fit me. I'm not going to let other people tell me how I should fight, how I should stand, how I should preach, how I should serve, how I should do it, how church should look and what it should be. I'm not going to copy and paste church. I'm not going to run with every fan. I'm glad that's working for them, but it may not work for us. And I'm going to have the courage to say I'm going to be different. And I'm going to do it different. I'm going to be faithful to what God, and people may think they're mad and it's suicide, but you know what? Sometimes in the ridiculous, God does the miraculous. He does incredible things. Because David didn't go out ill equipped or unarmed. He went in the name of the Lord. And this is the point of this. He said, I, I, don't, I don't need this because it doesn't fit me and it doesn't work for me. He said, I'll take my sling and my stones because that's what I'm familiar with, that's what I'm used to, that's what I know. It's proved well in the past. I've killed a bear and a lion. I, I, I can use these things, but you, you're missing something, so you're missing the point. It's not our arms that's going to protect me, and it's not a sword that's going to give me victory. It's God. So it doesn't matter how, how well dressed I am or how not dressed, it's Him who's going to give me the victory. He, the battle belongs to the Lord. See, Saul, Saul had the armor, but he didn't have the anointing. David had the anointing, but he didn't have the armor. Which one won? Which one stood up? Which one are we still talking about 2,000 years later? Which one became the giant slayer? He definitely needs that armor, armor off my dad. That was a good, that, that, that was good, I didn't know it was. Amen, Dave, thank you for pushing that, it's okay. Well done. But, you know, that's what they had. He had the anointing without the armor. So that the armor without the anointing. But which one made the difference? Unwritten rules, things that are not in the Bible, that are not absolutes, that we make absolutes because it suits us and it fits us. You have to do it this way. That's the language of unwritten rules. Oh, we've always done it like that. You can't change that. Why not? Why not? If it's not in the Bible, it's up for grabs. If it's not an absolute, then we can compromise, we can look at it, we can change it, we can deal with it. Unwritten rules are holding us back and stop us from progressing. Man's innovations become tomorrow's traditions, and then those traditions become bondage. The very thing that was invented to set people free then becomes a bondage to keep them in captivity. That's what the enemy does. 
God gives inspiration, man creates it, the devil takes hold of it, and he makes it a tradition and an absolute, and says you can't move from it. Revival only happens like this. God only moves like this. God will only use this person. Church has to look like this. Where does it say that in the Bible? Where are those unwritten rules that says that we have to do that? David didn't have to go to war in Saul's army, and in Saul's army. But what he did have to have was the favour and the love in the presence of God. They are the absolutes. And that's what we need in the church today. We don't need all the lights and the flashing and the excitement. Those things are good and I'm not against those things. You've got lights and stuff. It's great to pray for the revival and action. But these are not going to cause revival. These lights are not going to say the last thing I'm going to come in and say, Wow, well, I found Christ because what an amazing life show we've got. They're not. But what they will do is when they come in and God is moving and God is real and God is tangible and His presence is so heavy and so weighty and moving amongst His people, they leave the right to Him or run from Him. And either one is good. We want them to run to him, but if they're running from him, he's they're running from him, not because of our bad preaching and bad church, but because of the, of the fear of God. That's what they did in the New Testament. They either run to God or run from God. I'm ready to move. Number three, he confronts unwanted giants. This giant wasn't wanted. The people didn't want to hear this day after day. It was a thorn in the flesh, but nobody was willing to do anything about it until David came and stood up and actually challenged him. And he says these words, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. That was his confidence, that was his strength, that was his greatest weapon. He says, you've defied God, and God isn't gonna stand by and take that. And so I'm gonna come and show you who the real God is, not your God, but the God of Israel. You've defied him and brought disgrace, and God is gonna teach him a lesson. And the giant mocked him, and he, that Goliath said, you know, you come and eat me with a stick or by a dog, and he said, I'm going to give you your flesh for the birds here, I'm going to kill you today. But I love David's confidence and tenacity. It says, when, the, when, when Goliath came to meet him, David ran towards him. Everyone else was running away, but David ran towards him, because he, he really meant it. When he said, I'm coming in the name of the Lord God, and he will give them into my hand today, today I will have victory over you. He believed that. And I know that because he ran towards him. His actions spoke louder than his words. Now, if he had said that and then ran away, I would have some doubt. But he didn't. He ran towards him in confidence. And we know the story. He, slung, he threw his sling, hit him in the forehead. But Goliath fell to that place down. He took his sword, chopped his head off. End of story. But it took someone to confront that unwanted giant. David did the craziest thing, he actually trusted God. How radical is that? He actually trusted God to give him the victory. And I think that the giants today in our lives and the church and our communities that are taunting us and defying us and saying, I dare you to challenge me. I dare you to tell me this isn't right. I dare you to stand on the word of God. I dare you to declare the promises of God. I dare you, I, I, I defy you, I dare you to stick. Your beliefs that marriage is between a man and a woman. Oh, I dare you to say that in modern society. I dare you to say that sex outside of marriage is wrong. I dare you to say that abortion is wrong. I dare you to say these things. I dare you to say that I'm confused and messed up because of my gender and I don't know what to do. I dare you to say that. And they challenge us and confront us and defy you and mock us. And God said, I want to stand up because these giants are unwanted and they need to be dealt with. And there are giants in the church and in our lives. Do you know one of the biggest giants today is comfort? Come, we are being killed by comfort. Comfort is killing the church. Because we like things the way we like them. We like to be comfortable. Don't rock the boat. Apathy, complacency, selfishness. All of these things that creep in a lack of dying in self and stepping out and trusting God and living for others. Loving others with unconditional love, sacrifice, selflessness, all of these things are needed in the church. And the giants of comfort and complacency and apathy are what stand there and mock us and say, I dare you to challenge these. 
I dare you to preach on these things. I dare you to stand up for your congregation and tell on these things. They won't like you for it. They won't love you for it. They won't understand you for it. They'll misinterpret it. You'll be criticized for it. If you want to shrink your church, then go ahead. That's what the enemy says. I dare you. Go on and watch what I'm doing. You want to accept things? I'll accept them. But sometimes we need that day to not give that courage and say, you know what? I'm going to run from what this guy is. I'm sick and tired of this voice of defeat. I'm tired of the way things are. Something has to change. And may God give us the victory. And number four, when we are wholly discontent, it creates a containable boldness. I won't have to say much about this because Chris already preached it. In verse 51, he says, When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath. And the gates of Echo. Suddenly, cowards became courageous. The fearful became mighty. Those who were doing that and started to do something. Because one man stood up and said, You know what? I believe God. I trust God. I'm going in the name of God. And watch what happens. And he defeated a giant. And then everyone said, You know what? I think we can do this as well. It takes somebody to stand up to believe and step out for others to follow. And David was that man. And suddenly, uncontainable boldness rose up within the army of Israel. They actually became the fighting men that God knew they could be, but lacked the courage to do. And they took a teenager to lead them into this boldness and this courage and this strength. They pursued after the enemy. Because once the enemy saw his champion was dead, then they left and he ran and was afraid. And I really believe the Bible says, Submit to God, resist the enemy, he will flee from you. And when we kill the, the giants that he puts in our life, when we say, actually, we're not going to live for comfort, we're not going to live for pleasure, we're not going to live for ourselves, we're going to actually kill these giants, we're going to bring them down, we're going to stand again until the lion must fall. When that happens, the enemy doesn't say, okay, here we go, let, let's fight. He actually says, I'm going to run. I didn't expect you to respond like that. I didn't expect you to have that courage and that faith. I really thought that giant was intimidating enough. It's been there long enough to find you. Here. But now you've stood up against it. And now you've chopped his head off. And it has no effect on you. It doesn't intimidate you no more. So I'm off. I'm out here. I'll cut the tail and run. And then everybody else around you sees the victory. He sees the blessing. He sees the favor. And everybody else starts to say, well, I'm not happy. Because I've got giants in my life. I've got problems in my life. And God did that for them. So why can't he do it for me? And suddenly everybody gets courage and bold and strong and mighty and believing and happy. Suddenly we take off. And that's all I'm asking God to do this morning. Lord, will you not revive us again? Will you not take us, this small church, this small group of people whose hearts want you, long for you, love you, and create a desire in us of holy discontent so that we can say there is so much more. There's so much more. And we actually make an impact and a difference in our day and generation. But we said we've done the things of this world, we don't want any more man made ministries, man made programs, strategies, things that the slogan gets up to work hard at and achieve very little. We want you, O oh God, to come and lead us, guide us, strengthen us, equip us, anoint us, so that we do things that make eternal difference, not superficial difference, but eternal difference. I've said before, I'm not praying for fruit, I'm praying for the last thing to bring. I'm sick and tired of the fruit that shoots up and disappears so quickly. I'm sick and tired of the people who come and go out the back door and never stay. Our last different radical transformation where people say we're with you, we love you, we're willing to give our all. But people come to the altar again and repent and cry and weep. Where's that sound in the church again? Where's that sound? I don't think these things are, are, are old things of the past that we moved on from. And we're more contemporary than we don't need to do that anymore. I think we do. We need the weeping prophets of Jeremiah, the boldness of Elijah. We need the heart of Moses who sees people enslaved and he says, This is not good enough. Does your children go to a crisis and say, Do you need to move to your knees because they should? Does your family, your neighbors, your loved ones, does everybody think they go to heaven when we know they're not? But it has to move us to a point that is beyond just a nice little prayer. It has to move us to a desperation. I'm not happy with the church the way it is. I love this church. I'm proud to be the pastor of this church. I will stay as long as God wants me. I told you that. I mean, you know, I'll be done. I'll be very, very in the church probably. But I love it that much. 
but I'm never going to be content with what we have. Because I feel like God is saying, you just dip your toe into the sea, but what I want you to do is swim. You're paddling, but I want to submerge you. You're wet, but you're not wet enough. I want to submerge you. There's so much more. When Jesus told us, you know, he didn't say they'd come as a spring for our, our, our trip. He says, there'd be rivers. Have you, have you seen the kind of river when it's over from its bank? You know, I'm swimming in that here. But God says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get out of this. I'm sending the waves. I'm sending the, the living water. I'm reviving and refreshing. The wind is coming. And I want you to get out of this. And I believe all around the world, all around the UK, people are realizing and waking up for this. There's a stirring in the hearts of God's people for something more because they're not satisfied with what they have. There is a hope in this weekend. And I've, I've preached it this morning, but I can't not preach it. Only God, through the Holy Spirit, can produce that in us this morning. And so let's worship. Let's pray this morning. And then we're going to ask God to help us. Ask God to help us. I want you to be honest and as we stand. As we worship, I want you to be honest and say to God, God, do I really want more? Do I really want to be active in trouble? Do I really want to be discontent and seek God? Do I really want that? And if you don't feel that, that's okay, because then God can work with that. But don't deceive yourself, don't pretend. Let's ask God to put that desire within us. So that we come to that place of sacrifice and selflessness. So let's worship God.